So, bonjour, Sister Nahali. Um, ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, to start us off, uh, what was life like as a teenager whenever you had to make important decisions and choices in life that could shape your future? Okay. Um, yes, I have to remind <laughs> when I was a teenager. So, you know, my childhood, I moved a lot uh, because uh, we uh, went from one city to another city, but mainly was an, when I was a teenager, um, until high school, yes. I lived in Normandy, in Rouen, and uh, for me, what uh, the best memories of this time, um, it has been uh, my experience of uh, uh, scouting, because I was a girl guide, a, a Catholic girl guide, and um, I had the chance at uh, the age of, uh, I was almost 15, we had a summer camp in Ireland. So that was the first time I came here. <laughs> and why I uh, mentioned that, because uh, I was involved in the preparation of this summer camp. We had the first time in uh, New York Cork with the uh, Irish girl guide, uh, summer camp together. And then we went there by bike uh, with our bike on the ferry boat. And then we did a tour, uh, the Ring of Kerry, the Peninsula of Dingle. And I was in the team uh, to prepare the itinerary and uh, to, to, to lead. And I discovered that uh, I, I was, um, it was a very interesting experience for me uh, to prepare the itinerary for uh, the, the roadmap for the other uh, younger guide. And um, then I discover how it is important uh, to make the good choice, you know, to choose the, the, the good road, uh, the right road. And when, uh, okay, sometime in Ireland, you have to climb a lot. But I remember uh, once it was very difficult because we had everything on our bikes, you know, the dance, uh, uh, things for cooking. And, but uh, when we arrived at the top, there was such a beautiful view on the sea. <laughs> so that was an experience telling me how, when you have to do some efforts and uh, sometimes the road uh, is not so easy, but uh, it's also to, uh, then you can discover a new landscape. <laughs> so for me, that was this experience of, uh, you know, how to, to choose the good, uh, the right uh, roads. And uh, to do that also, sometimes it can be difficult or you can have some ob obstacles, but you, you will discover new landscape. And I can say after that, that has been the experience of my life. And could you share your thoughts on receiving the call of God at a young age and how it inspired you to undertake his work? Well, what I can say is that, um, in fact, during many years, I was raised as a Catholic in a Catholic family. I went to Catholic school. So I was part of the Catholic Girl Guide. And, but, uh, you know, during many years, I didn't really think about the call of God and uh, the idea of vocation. I had in my mindset, you know, to, be, uh, to get married, to be a mother, uh, mm. to work as, you know, most of the uh, women around me. <laughs> uh, so, so I had this model, uh, this pattern, and um, it was mainly uh, at the, uh, during my studies, so after high school, I went to study in a business school, and at the end of the studies, I, I, then I, uh, I, I had to uh, reflect more about, so okay, now I have studied, uh, I get a uh, I would get a, a degree um, and graduated from this business school, but what, what will I do now? <laughs> and, uh, and my true questions through which I began to listen to, 
uh, more to God and to the color of God was, but in fact, what is the true meaning of life? What is the true life? You know, because when you are young, you can experience many things and uh, uh, there are some experiences that uh, are good for you and fruitful and others uh, not so. I, I, could, I could begin to see that uh, some choices uh, uh, didn't make me happy and others were better. <laughs> So reflecting on that and with this uh, question, what is the true meaning of life? What is the true life? I remember one day during my studies, I, uh, because regularly I went to the chapel chaplaincy university, well, this is a school of chaplaincy. And uh, one day we received an image with a prayer from Saint Ignatius of Loyola. And maybe you, you have heard about this prayer is, uh, uh, in fact, it says, Lord, uh, receive, uh, in fact, it says, Lord, receive what I receive from you. <laughs> and uh, at a time, I had the feeling that in the gospel, when Jesus say, um, I am the life, I am the, the way, uh, I am the truth, I began to think, okay, that's an answer, and I can really uh, believe that Jesus is life, the truth, and the way. And so uh, to discover the true life, I have to follow Christ. And uh, so that was mainly my path during my studies. And at the end of my studies, I decided before working, before uh, beginning a, a job, uh, to spend one year in Lebanon as volunteer because I had some uh, friends before me who went to, to do some volunteer work in, in other countries. So it gave me this idea and I discovered that, okay, it will be good to serve one year before uh, beginning to work because uh, I also, you know, as girl guide and with all my uh, experience, I, I discovered that, uh, yes, we have to give, we have to serve. <laughs> and uh, my year in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut, it was in 1992, uh, 1993, and it was just after the war. And I was a teacher in a high school with uh, uh, Lebanese uh, teens. They have grew up, grown up uh, only with the war, you know. And so being far from my country, uh, listening to their life, discovering all the, the suffering. And uh, then I hear more that, uh, okay, everything we have received, and uh, I was rather lucky in France to have, you know, rather good ed education, uh, to have received a lot. And I discover that there is no sense to receive <laughs> If it's not to give uh, to give them back, and so that was also through that and through my experience of prayer encountering Christ in Lebanon, I did for the first time the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. So I had a deep experience of uh, encounter with Christ and meeting other young religious uh, in Lebanon it begins to come to my mind, okay, that's a possible life. And uh, I met the, some who were happy who were, and they were serving uh, people. And uh, so that's how uh, I began my discernment. Then I came back to France for two years, work in a marketing communication agency. But with this idea, I have to continue to discern my vocation so, yes, yeah, so the first important step was, okay, as a Christian, uh, our vocation is to be discovered. You know, there are different paths, different calls, and we, each of us, we have to discern uh, how God is calling you, is calling us, and that's how... Wonderful. After that, I entered religious life. <laughs> Fascinating. 
Oshin, did you want to come in at this stage now in terms yes. of, of much of her working with, with, with younger people? With youth. Yeah, with younger people. Well, Sister Natalie, lovely to meet you, first of all. And um, I was wondering what really spurred you on to working with young people in particular? You worked a lot with university students and young yeah, people. Yeah, 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 and young people. And uh, yes, you know, mostly during almost uh, 30 years, <laughs> I have been working with uh, young people. So for me, it's, it, it was a joy because, you know, what I like the most with young people, and especially I think teenagers and young adults, uh, maybe it's very strong when you are students. It's a, a, a time of your life when you discover a lot and when uh, where you a time when you change. Uh, because it's a long way to discover really who you are, uh, what to do, uh, to discover your uh, vocation. And uh, we all, we are educated by our parents, family, we are coming from, uh, you know, a city, we are shaped also by uh, some ideas and, and, and uh, some, it's, it meets our true personality, but we also sometimes are in a kind of boxes. <laughs> and uh, so the time, uh, especially as teenager and young adult, you you become more uh, you discover more your singular path uh, and so for me my best memories and what I like with young people is when you see young people who are growing up uh, they are changing they became more uh, uh, happy also and we know that uh, for many of them and especially at this time I pray a lot for young people I think about them because I know it's a very difficult uh, time now. But when you see some people, some young people who were in sometimes in isolation, in suffering, and then they flourish, <laughs> you know, for me that truly is a sign of the work of the Holy Spirit. So for me, the being with young people is mainly about contemplating how the Holy Spirit is working through the heart of young people, because it's not a matter of age. Uh, the Holy Spirit is given to everybody and so also to young people uh, to help them to discern uh, how the Holy Spirit is guiding them. And also, I, I can already say that I have been transformed by young people. Because uh, we also, and that's my experience, it, it's in a reciprocity we learn also the older generation, we learn from young people who have many gifts, ideas. They also need uh, guides and uh, older people, but it's, it's in this uh, reciprocity. So, and the gift of young people is also, you know, energy and uh, uh, ideas, dreams, and so they, they boost <laughs> uh, the church. Uh, sometimes they want they want to change the world, to change the church. So sometimes it can uh, shake up. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, for me, yes. Uh, I like very much this image given by Pope Francis. One day he was asked in a book, "God is Young." It's a very interesting book. An interview with Pope Francis. And he was asked, when you think about young people, uh, what do you think? What is the image that comes to you? And Pope Francis said, uh, I think about young people who are walking. Uh, so that means you are in an unbalance because you have to rise one uh, leg. And uh, so uh, for me, young people uh, tell us about uh, that life is, uh, is movement. <laughs> we have to be mobile. We need the roots, but we have to be mobile. And especially in this world that is uh, changing very rapidly, we are in a change of time, a change of world. And so young people help us uh, to keep moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oshin, did you want to ask something about World Youth Day? Or yeah, I was just about to say, you've had many roles in relation to like youth 
what would you say you enjoyed most about these uh, events like World Youth Day? Well, I would say, um, and for me, uh, the joy also of my experience of ministry with young people is that uh, in different, I have been in different positions, as, as you said, in campus ministry, uh, with uh, the Ignatian Youth Network, with uh, the Scout also, for, uh, then at the Bishop Conference, and especially for World Youth Day in, uh, I have always been working with team. And I think a key uh, point uh, to be with young people is teamwork. And my experience of World Youth Day is mainly experience uh, of teamwork, uh, also with young people, because in France, we truly have this idea that you can't um, uh, minister to young people without young people. So young people are the first one who can evangelize other young people. And we have uh, fostered and implemented a model of uh, co-responsibility, uh, co-leading a, a more senior <laughs> like me <laughs> and uh, a younger. So for instance, um, uh, the first time when I was a group leader for the Diocese of uh, Créteil to organize uh, World Youth Day to go to Sydney at that time, uh, I, had a, I was uh, the leader of the, uh, the delegate, the diocesan delegate for World Youth Day, but uh, I worked with a team uh, with uh, people from uh, until uh, 70 years old and uh, young people and different uh, vocations, different. Uh, uh, and then at the Bishop Conference, each time we have, because we had to coordinate the French delegation. So uh, for instance, for Madrid, it was 45,000 French uh, young people with all the, uh, all the dioceses, movements, communities, so many group leaders. And each time I have hired uh, young, uh, woman or man as coordinator of World Youth Day, and we were uh, both uh, the young people was the coordinator, and I was uh, with her or him uh, to support, to coach, to co-lead. Uh, so I truly think you you know that there is a a kind of motto: alone you go faster. <laughs> But together with a team, uh, you go better uh, and you go further. You go further. Right. So okay. I the, truly think that's the important point. You've journeyed a lot with young people. I think John wants to come in. John comes from the Sarah Malabar community here. Oh, in, great. Uh, I think John wanted to talk about the sin. Is that right, John? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, bonjour, uh, so Nathalie. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Uh, so I just want to ask uh, about uh, the 2018 Synod and if you could just briefly explain to us uh, what it's about, you know, uh, and how it relates to the youth in the church today. So the Synod of Young People, it was a, a wonderful uh, experience because uh, I had the chance to be involved in the Synod preparation, so two years preparation in France. Uh, because at that time I was a director of the National Office for Young and Vocation, but also in Rome in different states. And what I have seen that gave me a lot of hope, <laughs> you know, Pope Francis has asked young people to, uh, to give their voice, uh, to listen to, and uh, especially in Rome, in the different step of preparation, I have seen that there was a first uh, international meeting and then the press synod, young people really spoke frankly about uh, you know, their ideas, their vision of the church. Also, they, they were able to give some critics on some points. Uh, and, uh, and also during the synod, they, they have played a major role and they really could speak uh, frankly and freely and they have been uh, they have been listened to. 
And I was very touched during the Synod on Young People because listening to, you know, Synod is mainly bishops uh, and Bishop Donald was there, but listening to the voices of the bishop when they had to give, you know, their four minute presentation, I will, it was mainly for me, I was listening to the voices of young people. I have been listening during, uh, you know, almost 30 years. And the vision, the experience of the youth and the, what was bring, brought at the Synod and the outcomes of the Synod was uh, mainly resonating <laughs> Uh, with uh, all, also all um, uh, I, I, I have uh, discovered, shared, written about, and, and work with other youth ministers uh, in France and in different countries. So we can say that the Synod was like a sound box <laughs> for young people and for uh, the, the uh, to, to, you know, it, it was. Uh, not something just coming like this, but after many years of World Youth Day, of experience in the local churches with young people, you had this kind of convergence uh, or uh, now rather clear vision uh, expressed in Christus Vivit about how to, uh, to accompany uh, young people and to help them to, to, meet, to meet Christ so that they could be alive. Thank you very much for your response. And uh, also, I just want to ask, um, well, since I come from the Sarah Malabar community, uh, we're very used to uh, the idea of synods, mm -hmm. uh, because synods take place uh, every two years or something like that. And uh, th many decisions are made uh, regarding liturgy and so on and so forth. So uh, what do you expect uh, the following synods to accomplish? And... Uh, what do you think about uh, synodality in the church? Well, um, coming back to the synod on youth, our experience has been that the synod on uh, young people has been a kind of uh, true experience of synodality and a kind of school of synodality for many participants. And I was convinced before, and the Synod has reinforced this, uh, for me, this true conviction, that young people are engine of synodality because they don't want, you know, just to be uh, in, in a kind of uh, uh, hierarchical and, and vertical church that just say to them, okay, don't say anything, listen and apply what we say. Young people, they want to be protagonists, to be involved, to be, um, so the only way to be the church with young people is to be a synodal church. And we have discovered through the synod on young people that it's not only for young people, the way to be the church today in this time, in, the, in this context, and Pope Francis is very clear about that, it's, it's a call of God uh, in this time of history to be a synodal church. And uh, a few weeks ago, I had a, a conversation with a theologian from India uh, who told me about the experience of, of, your, of your church. So what I want to say is that we are convinced that the preparation of the next synod, that is already on the road because the synod has been announced on synodality, and it, the synod is coming after the synod on young people and the synod on, on the Amazon, to, uh, to uh, not only to have a, a nice gathering during one month with bishops and talk about synodality, okay, that's, that's great, but the key issue is uh, to help to implement synodality at all levels of the church. So our work uh, for the next synod is truly a work also with uh, the local churches connected with them, uh, and to, to see together how um, we can uh, continue this synodal journey uh, so that uh, the church can be more synodal because it's not just uh, an internal uh, view of the church, it's about the mission of the church and to be missionary today, to meet, uh, to 
to be at the front lines of the missions with so many issues. Uh, uh, it, it requires to be a synodal church, but it's a long way. And I'm truly happy to, uh, to have learned that uh, in, in Ireland now the, you continue the synodal path with the idea of, of a synod. And uh, so that's our hope, you know, for the next synod that it will involve and uh, it will be a, prepar uh, a stronger emphasis on the preparation of the synod in the local churches because that's also now with the, the new constitution about the Synod, Episcopalis Communio, uh, the Synod is a process and the consultation phase to listen to all the faithful, to all the people is truly uh, important. Okay. Can I move on perhaps now to Holly? Holly has been leading a book club during Lent on uh, Christus Vivit and Gerard Gallagher's yeah. book for which you okay. wrote the chapter. Yeah. So Holly, can I pass over to you now to ask some questions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Bishop. Um, good afternoon, Sister Natalie. Um, I know just building on the conversation of Synod, um, one of the fruits of the Synod was Christus Vivit. And um, you, about two years later, uh, a little book called Exploring Christus Vivit was published and you reflected on uh, Jesus Ever Young. And in chapter two, Pope Francis clearly makes clearly states the, the distinction or the difference between the words young people and youth, young being a stage of life and youth being an attitude of mind and heart in mm -hmm. which anyone can possess. So they say that a youthful church um, will always be open to renewal. So how can the church be youthful and re uh, maintain its youthfulness? Well, I think in th is that this uh, chapter two of Christus Vivit, and so uh, uh, Chera Galarder, you know, asked different people to comment uh, different chapters for this book. <laughs> so I received chapter two, but it was interesting to, to read it and to deepen it. And uh, for me, um, there is a, uh, what is very, very interesting in this chapter is that Pope Francis highlight that Jesus is the true model of synodality. And uh, especially he recalls that uh, this uh, story of Jesus, you know, going in pilgrimage with his parents to Jerusalem and then uh, coming back, that he was mingling among uh, the others. And uh, so this renewal of the church uh, that is needed, and uh, synodality for, for the, the aim is to serve better the world, the, the common good of our society, to, to build a fraternity, you know, as a fraternity Tutti also ask us. The only way is to be together, you know, all the Batais are called to be missionary disciples. You don't have, because we are coming, I won't talk, uh, much about that, but uh, with through the history, uh, at the time there was the idea that the church has different categories of people, very different. So the uh, the pastors on one side and the faithful on the other side. And now after Vatican II, and that's this idea of synodality. The most important is what we what we have in common with baptism is stronger than all our differences. Okay, we have different position, mission, different vocations, but uh, it's the gospel. Um, you have to be together, united uh, to minister and for the mission. So, uh, and I think that uh, young people who most of them you, and you today, you know, it's interesting because you didn't ask only one young people to do the interview. You wanted to do that with a, a group and that usually is the way young people work in a collaborative way, uh, you like to be in a group. So that's why you can uh, also help the church to be more in this synodal collegial way uh, and not, you know, uh, to, to first uh, emphasize uh, the, the difference. And, and so it's, it's yes, that's what I could uh, 
I could say about that. Thank you. Um, you just touched on uh, co-responsibility er earlier on, which is a key word of Christus Vivit. Yeah. Um, making reference to young people with roots and youth ministry, um, how can we bring the young and old together to discern the way forward? Is there anything that we can introduce to our parishes with the aim of encouraging intergenerational relationships? Well, it's, it's a key thing, and you can notice that each time Pope Francis is speaking about young people, he's speaking also about grandparents and uh, older people. And I often say, and I, I think what is difficult nowadays uh, is that inter intergenerational dialogue and, and counter is, a, is mainly like intercultural dialogue. So you have John coming from uh, India, I imagine, <laughs> uh, with, uh, so, you know, uh, it's not, we have to learn. It's not so easy to communicate, to understand uh, each other when you are from different cultures. And young people nowadays, you grew up in another world than uh, our grandparents. Uh, so we have to truly find the way to understand the other. So. All those people have to understand young people, but also you, young people, <laughs> you have to understand why uh, in parishes older people are acting in another way. <laughs> and uh, I think what can help this uh, intergenerational dialogue, you need people who can be a bridge maker bridge builder, you know, who know both generations. Because sometimes if you just put together uh, sometimes there is such a the gap, it's not so easy, but if you have people who are truly well connecting with the young generation and also with the uh, oldest generation, then you can find uh, the, the way uh, to create common space. And I think that the best way to do this dialogue, you know, it's like interreligious dialogue, if you only uh, stay in academic uh, places to speak, okay, you can learn from each other. But the best way is to encounter and to, to have common project, to do things together. For instance, uh, many young people, they want to, they are very generous. And in this time, they, they want to help homeless. Uh, if you do that together with older people, then it change and you, you have this dialogue. And so I think our parishes and different places have to be creative, uh, you know, to, to create space where we can uh, serve together, or for instance, about also all the uh, ecological issues. Lauda to see is a very good uh, roadmap to bridge young people and older people, for instance. <laughs> Can we move on to Zara? Because you've got you're the first person to have a very important post as a woman in in, in the Vatican. Um, and Zara, I know, is very interested in Laudato Si as well as the whole environmental thing. So, Zara, can we pass over to you at this stage? Uh, yep. Well, uh, bonjour, Sir Natalie. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this important Bravo pour le um, français. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> for your French. Uh, um, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to ask you, as the first woman to hold the position of undersecretary to the Senate of Bishops, um, did you find it challenging to work in a traditionally male-dominated environment? <laughs> Uh, well, in, in the staff here, because the uh, Secretariat of the Synod, the General Secretariat of Synod, it's, it's a team of um, permanent staff uh, of 15. And uh, there are already two women <laughs> who have been working here. Uh, one is a lay consultant, the other is a lay woman. Uh, well, they are mainly in the administration, and, but they are part of the, of the team. So uh, I'm not the only one. <laughs> and um, I was also prepared because, you know, when I was working at the Bishop Conference, uh, many times I was, uh, for instance, I took part every year to the plenary assembly of the bishops. Uh, I was the second woman appointed uh, 
as a director of the national office. So, uh, I, you know, for me, the best thing that God has created is that he has created us both as men and women. <laughs> Uh, and um, I feel, and what is very helpful for me, you know, now at the Vatican, uh, I am the first under secretary for the general secretariat of the Synod, but there are already a few one, but already other under secretaries uh, at the dicastery for consecrated life, lady, family, and life. So I have, um, when I had some, um, conference here or meetings, I have already met them. So I had uh, some uh, kind of role models be before me. <laughs> and uh, th that's very helpful, I think, also. Uh, but um, I, I can say that I have been very well welcome in, uh, in this office and more broadly in the Vatican with people I know or others I didn't know. Uh, now I am temporarily living because the big challenge for me is that, you know, I am Xavier's sister, it's an international order. I have always been living in a community of sisters, you know, <laughs> all these years, but we don't have a community in Rome. So it's a big change for me. And so now the Vatican is giving me an accommodation uh, in a house with priests working at the Curia. So I am the only, <laughs> only woman at this uh, Domus Sacerdotalis. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a great issue for our society and for our church. It's not, uh, I don't, even if we focus sometime on women issues and it's important, but the key issue is how to be men and women together in the society and in the church and to find a relation, positive relationship with mutual respect, reciprocity, partnership, uh, collaboration. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, we have to continue to find this, uh, this way. Uh, to work together and to be together. Okay, um, and how did you feel when you were appointed as the undersecretary <laughs> to the Son of the Bishop? Well, that was a great, great surprise because, you know, I never imagined that. Uh, well, I was consultor, but uh, consultor was not a permanent. Uh, oh, I was supposed to begin another mission. <laughs> uh, so, I was truly really surprised, but it's interesting. And I have learned a lot about the way the Holy Spirit is working in our life. Because at the same time, it was, as I told you, a big surprise. And so I was surprised, uh, I was uh, shaken, shaken up, <laughs> you know. But uh, also taking time to process this call, um, uh, prayers, who, I could discover that, uh, you know, there is also a kind of coherence and continuity because uh, when all my experience with young people, the experience of the Synod, the last two years, I was uh, uh, doing a research in ecclesiology on the Synod on young people and synodality. Uh, so I feel and that's the way the Holy Spirit is working in us both through newness and through continuity. And that's, that's tradition in the church. It's, it's a creative fidelity, a, crea a creative faithfulness, uh, you know. And um, it's not just, you know, being uh, put here with uh, no, no background and you discover a anything. There is a lot of newness and I have to, learn to discover a lot. But at the same time, uh, I feel grateful that this call is, um, is also a kind of uh, path of unification <laughs> uh, where I can bring also uh, all my experience and uh, different dimensions of, of my life. So that's, and, but it, it, it asks me a lot of uh, confidence, trust in, to trust in God, to trust uh, yeah. 
because and I will finish with that. I often tell young people that a very strong, important uh, motto that God is always giving you the grace to uh, follow the call you receive. So that's what also, uh, that's what helped me <laughs> to be here and to begin this new, it's truly a new adventure. But okay. Can I, can I bring in Gemma at this stage? Gemma, you wanted to talk a little bit about consecrated life, religious life, yeah. life as a sister and so on. Gemma's yeah. one of our artists here, very keen on, on, on painting. Anyway, Gemma. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in like prayer life and religion life, know of a sister. So I am, um, so I really like, like, I'm really interested in like what your routine is and your hopes for religious life in the future, what you think you could see in the future. Well, you know, religious life, like the church and like all of our institutions uh, are in this time of, um, in this changing time. So there is also, a, it's also, the time of transformation. But when you look back at the history of consecrated life, it's from almost the beginning of the church. And then through the centuries, you had different uh, style, different communities. Um, so at this time, I am hopeful because I see, and the, there are still some vocations for consecrated life. Uh, and I am, we are very grateful because in our community, I am from a small order, the Xavier sister, we are only 115, but each year we have new members, uh, novices, and, but uh, we can see that in the landscape of religious life today, and you can see that also in Ireland and in many Western countries, there are more and more communities where, uh, they are mostly all the sisters, or, but they are still alive and until the end, you know. But you have the emergence also of new forms, new communities. Uh, for instance, now it's interesting, there is an increase of vocations to be a consecrated virgin in many uh, countries. So I don't, uh, I have been working a lot and reflecting and discerning with others about uh, religious life in this time and the future of religious life. But I feel that um, it's very difficult to imagine the future of religious life because it will also uh, take new forms. Uh, but I'm confident that consecrated life will continue. <laughs> And you have orders that have been through, uh, you know, long, long history that uh, will continue. But you have also, in each context and is historical uh, and epoch, you have new forms. And what is interesting nowadays is that uh, there is also a very strong call to, to, and it's also about synodality, to work more in a you know, uh, in synergy, and you have, for instance, new kind of communities, uh, inter-congregational, inter uh, you know. Before, you, you had, you know, like boxes with different communities, and now there are more uh, relationship, partnership, uh, and, and young consecrated uh, sisters, or men and women, they also need to meet others. So that's my hope for consecrated life that we continue this. Um, yes, there is a need for also renewal uh, with all the church, but this path has to be discerned and we don't know yet uh, exactly <laughs> what, uh, yes, what will be the forms of consecrated life uh, but, but we, we just know that it, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's an important part of the church because it's also about charism, but uh, you have also today many other forms of uh, involvement in the church. And I am also very grateful for so many lay uh, missionaries and uh, 
the ministers. I think there's never been renewal in the church without communities of yeah, strong yeah. women mm. and men who, who mm. really have been in the forefront of renewing the church in every yeah, generation. Yeah. There yeah, is yes. no renewal without such consecrated communities of talented, strong people who decide to give their everything together. Uh, I, I think we in Derry here have a sister who died, Sister Claire Crockett, who died in Ecuador in oh. um, an earthquake. She was 33 or 34, and mm. she has become a really, just died five years ago, she's become a very strong figure for, for apostolic zeal here mm. um, in, in, in the diocese, and particularly in the city, big mural of her on the wall, and the big events coming up in July, in, in April, for the fifth anniversary of her, of her death. So oh, yeah. mm -hmm. if, you may see great things coming from Derry. Mm. And you may yeah. have some of the great things from Derry. I know that. I know that. Afternoon. <laughs> Sister Natalie, thank you so much for giving us your time. Oh, it's but thank you. Thank you. Story. Okay, thank you so much for being also here and all your questions. And uh, I wish you all the best. And I hold you in my prayer. Uh, and also can your diocese. Can we finish with a short prayer? Glory be to the Father. Yeah and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as Amen. it was in the Amen. beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.